Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us uh, for this culture night uh, entitled Terry Pratchett at the Open, uh, at the, I keep saying that, at the Unseen University, not the Open University, that's an entirely different thing. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to just run you through uh, what, we're, what we're all about in terms of the Pratchett Project, and uh, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to the system for those of you who haven't been part of the conference so far. So um, the Pratchett Project started in uh, about three years ago when uh, some uh, researchers in, the, in Trinity College Dublin came together purely through having an interest in Terry Pratchett's life and work. And uh, then we discovered that we were one of only three universities in the world that has a comprehensive collection of uh, Terry Pratchett's work in the library. And when I say comprehensive, what I mean is a copy, at least one copy of every single book that Pratchett ever wrote and every single translation that was ever written based on any of his work and an awful lot of ephemeral stuff and a whole lot of uh, different publications about Terry Pratchett too. So uh, we came together to create this project and the first uh, iteration was actually a Culture Night event when we were uh, speaking to people in Trinity College uh, about the research that we were doing. So some of us were talking about children's literature and some of us were talking about translation and some of us were talking about digital humanities. And this is how we kept going for some time. But then last year, we decided that the time had come to really uh, increase what we were doing because it was very clear that there was so much interest in Terry Pratchett uh, not only his work, not only uh, the books that he wrote, but also his life and uh, his legacy now. So we uh, we developed the uh, we developed the project such that we could um, get people involved. So we ran a hackathon where people came to Trinity College and they were uh, helping us to work out specific questions to do with his collection, like we were asking how many translators were there at that point who'd ever worked on, on uh, translating Pratchett and how many publishers were there. And then we came up with this really nice um, spreadsheet as a result, which has been really, really useful for us afterwards because we've been able to say with uh, a certain amount of um, uh, clarity exactly who was translating Pratchett when and what they did and then when they stopped doing it. Uh, then we also did uh, a really nice event where we invited four of Pratchett's translators to come and discuss with us what it's like to translate uh, Terry Pratchett's work. And uh, so we had uh, a French translator, a Spanish translator, a Polish translator and a Hungarian translator who all came to us. Uh, uh, at, it was at the end of September last year and um, for uh, International Day of Languages, I think it is, or European Day of Languages. And um, they discussed translating the humor in uh, Pratchett's book, um, Pyramids. And that was a really, really fun event with about 150 people, I think, turned up. It was really, really well attended and it was a really funny event too. Then that brings us up to this year, which is the first year that we've ever had a conference. And for those of you who have been in the conference, you already know, but uh, we've had wonderful two days of uh, talks about everything from uh, translation, which is my field, so it's the first thing that comes to mind. We've had gender, we've had uh, just so many things, the whole gamut of uh, experience when it comes to Pratchett studies. and. Uh, the, we don't have the final numbers for how many people have uh, attended yet, but it's it's well over, well, it's over 600 as far as I can see just now at a rough guess. Uh, so that's just incredible. Even if we tried to run the conference on site, we wouldn't have a room that was big enough 
to house that many people in any reasonable way. So in some ways, us being forced to do these events online has been actually really helpful for us because it's meant that we can reach lots more people and they can reach us too, because it could be that they couldn't have traveled to Dublin to give their talk for whatever reason. So uh, we're really, really grateful that people have joined us for this, uh, for the conference. And now we're moving into this uh, outreach event where people are joining us, not only from across Dublin and across Ireland, but around the world to listen to some presentations from uh, people who are intimately re uh, involved in uh, either research to do with Terry Pratchett or active uh, activities to do with collating Pratchett's work uh, or um, activities to do with uh, the fandom surrounding Pratchett and his life and his work. So I'm going to start off uh, with a short presentation. I'm just going to walk you through how to use the system just in case you don't know already. So let me start. OK, that's the event in case you didn't know. If you have clicked on here by mistake, this is so you know that you're in the wrong place. OK, so uh, if you would. Oh, OK, so. Each presenter is going to have around 20 minutes and we'll just talk. We'll just give our presentations and uh, we won't jump in mid mid sentence or anything like that after the presentation there'll be actually more than 10 minutes because we have we have quite a considerable amount of time in between each talk we decided to leave lots of space because there's so much dialogue around Pratchett's work that uh, it was a bit mean to leave it to 10 minutes so uh, we won't be uh, checking the clock religiously on that score uh, if you want to ask a question you won't be able to do it orally, but what you can do is enter it into the chat box and then we will choose the ones, choose the questions which are best and then we'll pose them to the uh, presenter orally. So uh, if you open the chat box and then just type, we'll be able to see them. And what we've noticed during the conference is that there's so many people typing all the time that it, it's really, really helpful if you can start your question with a cue so that we can easily see which, uh, which comments are questions and which ones are comments. Uh, if you want to get rid of the chat box, that's fine. Just press the X in the bottom right hand corner and it will disappear for you and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, and as I say, yeah, we'll, we'll choose the questions which are most appropriate and we'll, we'll pose those so that we can have a little conversation with the presenter. Um, so if you wouldn't mind keeping your questions brief, one or two sentences is perfect. If you want to zoom in, <clears throat> as you can see, the screen is not massive when it comes to uh, the slides. So if you can't see anything, or if you want to zoom in for whatever reason, you can start with that little button, and uh, not the one at the very top right, uh, top left hand corner, but the one just below it, which has a little page and a little magnifying glass. If you click on there, you'll be able to have all sorts of different options for uh, zooming in and moving things around. Uh, and then if you do want to leave us, then you can either just close the tab, that will make you leave, or you can press that button in the top left-hand corner first, and then that will open a new menu, and at the bottom of that menu will be leave session. So if you press there, it will just close down. And the final thing to say is that the Pratchett project has now been running for a few years, and we would really like to hear from you. So if, you, if you'd if you like to join in with us or if you'd just like to follow us because you're interested in Pratchett's life and work, please do follow us on, on uh, Facebook. So you can see the link there. It's just, if you search for Pratchett Project, you'll find us immediately. Uh, the same with Twitter. If you search for at Pratchett Proj, you'll find us. And if you'd like to drop, drop us an email, please do. Uh, you're very welcome to email us and ask us what we're doing. I'm also, I've just created, uh, for the conference actually, I created a sign-up form so that you can uh, you can um, join the uh, mailing list. And if you'd like to do that, then uh, you could, there you go, I've just put it into the chat box. So if you'd like to join uh, the mailing list, we'll send you out 
information to do with new uh, events as soon as we hear about them or as soon as we organize them. So that's the end of my pre presentation presentation. So I'm going to start now. Uh, I'm going to start this off. I'll, I'll be the first person to present and I'm going to talk to you today about Terry Pratchett and brain health. So I hope you can see. Yeah, I hope you can see my presentation. And uh, the reason why I decided to um, talk about this this year, uh, I'm not a neuroscientist in any way. And uh, actually, um, while I'm interested in the subject, I'm very well aware that I'm in no way qualified to speak about it. Um, my actual uh, research background is in translation studies, so I'm much more at home talking about language than about um, somebody's brain. But I found it so moving and so interesting to um, research uh, Terry Pratchett's journey through his uh, brain health um, uh, uh, journey, I guess. Um, that uh, I wanted to share with you what I found out and how it left me at the end of my journey of uh, finding these things out. So uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm going to start off by introducing who Terry Pratchett is. I'm sure there's none of you who don't know this, but anyway, I, it's good practice, so I will. So Terry Pratchett was born in 1948 and he lived until 2015 and He's remembered as an English humorist, satirist, and author of fantasy novels, especially the com uh, especially comical works. And the best known of these are the Discworld series of 41 novels. He sold more than 85 million books worldwide in 40, I think it's actually 41 languages now, but it's around 40, 41. And uh, he was the UK's best-selling author of the 1990s. He was a, uh, appointed officer of the Order of the British Empire in uh, 1998 and was knighted for services to literature in 2009. Uh, he won the annual Carnegie Medal in 2001 and received the World Fantasy Award for uh, Life Achievement in 2010. <clears throat> uh, in 2007, he was misdiagnosed as having, uh, having had a minor stroke several years before so, uh, something happened and they they knew something had happened but they were trying to work it out what it was so they thought initially that it was a stroke and then later that year they decided it must be early onset alzheimer's disease <clears throat> uh, and they they realized that he had a a rare form of the disease which is called posterior cortical cortical atrophy. You'll see that I'm not an expert when I try to explain the, uh, describe the words. And uh, it's called PCA. Uh, and this is a, a kind of uh, Alzheimer's which attacks the areas at the back of the brain, especially those associated with spelling and visual processing. He was highly technically minded, always working with a computer. But as his condition developed, he needed to adapt the way that it worked. And uh, this uh, aspect of him working with computers has actually been quite interesting for us when we've been trying to work with his, um, um, his work. Because with an author, uh, very, often, uh, very often they leave handwritten notes or handwritten uh, manuscripts or something like this, which can be digitized, and then we can analyze the handwriting. And this is one way that if we were trying to work out when someone's condition started to develop, we might be able to find clues. But if someone only ever writes on a computer, never writes anything substantial using a pen, we can't really do that in quite the same way. We have to look in more subtle ways at how they use the language and how they use characters or how they use um, uh, setting or scene to try and work out how, uh, how the, the disease has been developed or how it's manifested or whether it's manifested at any particular time. So my, my uh, presentation is full of uh, videos because I want you to see Terry talking from his own experience. 
This is a quiet day. The internet's open on that one. Address book's open on that one. The work in progress is on that one. And for some reason or other, that's iTunes. Why have you got six screens? Because I haven't got enough room for eight. Uh, the reason I've stopped it, because I'm actually, this is real first draft. I've got to think a bit about the next bit. I used to be a high speed touch typist. I laughed in the face of the spell checker. But then one day last year, it all started to go wrong. I'd look down and I'd see the same sentence twice. I thought Microsoft Word was out to get me. Ah, oh, one of those moments. Where you just lose a key. There's a word there, uncharacteristic. But just then, I lost the S. You're just thinking, where the hell is it? Something goes ping. At that moment, the brain chose not to see the S. OK, so uh, as you can see, uh, Terry Pratchett was really very candid about how he could speak about his condition, which was something that was very, it still is something that's very rare um, because of the stigma that's, that's associated with uh, brain diseases. Um, by 2008, he found it too difficult to write dedications when signing books and started dictating to his assistant, Rob Wilkins, who we heard, uh, heard from yesterday, or by using speech recognition software. So he's been signing for about three hours, 13 minutes at the moment. Like taking the album out on the road, isn't it, for a band? Getting that feedback, as Terry Stamina has always amazed me. The adrenaline is working well. The specialist is saying to him very much, uh, do the things you enjoy, keep, keep doing it, keep the gardening, keep walking and keep doing events like this. It's for Craig. Yeah. After five long hours, I'm having a bit of trouble with my spelling. Bronwyn, well, that's gonna, I know that's going to have a Y in there somewhere. Uh, two, B, R, O, N. End of the day, handwriting totally gone. <laughs> But in my defence, no one spells their name correctly these days anyway. S-H-A-N-N-E. Now, my word. Thank you. Uh, what was it? Take note for the title. Take note for the title. Oh, actually, uh, I see, yeah. Okay. Okay, I like it, yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. I'll try that. Hello. Yeah, you assign that to Mike, Mr. Finn, after the end. To Mike. Mike. Mike with an E at the end. Yeah, M-I-K-E. Oh, yes, I see what you mean. Yeah, Mr. Mike. So there we go. Next. So, as you can see, uh, Pratchett was incredibly... Um, uh, passionate when it comes to uh, the, the devotion that he gave to his fans. But reading became increasingly difficult for him as the brains, as his brain's ability to process visual information was compromised. So I'm trying to read without a, I'm trying to get a shadow off the book. At every convention, I read a sneak preview of my new novel so that the diehard fans can hear it before anyone else. Actually, ah, the shadow is my head. Um, <laughs> sure. It takes an unusual man to make up a hymn in a hurry, and such a man was Captain Roberts. He knew every hymn in the antique and contemporary hymn book, and sang his way through them loudly and joyously whenever he was on watch, which had been one of the reasons for the mutiny. But half an hour into the reading, the PCA makes its appearance. His father... Sorry, I'm having difficulty with getting away from the shadows. Um, where many grateful boys, uh, where many grateful boys 
had left the axe or one like it for those who came after. Sorry, I'm, I'm, the shadow keeps going over the book. I do apologize. And if it were, oh, sorry, again, back to the shadow has come back course again. Okay. Um, are you in tears yet or would you like even more tears? Why don't you go away? <laughs> So as I already said, um, it, it's difficult for us to watch this, but uh, for Pratchett, his reaction to the situation was very different to most people. Um, <clears throat> he was really, really candid about the situation, and he was one of the first uh, celebrities, if, if we want to use that word, who became highly vocal about having this kind of condition, and not only stating that he had the condition and maybe trying to get sympathy for it, which I don't get the sense that he was trying to do at all. Uh, but he wanted to do something about it. He's a very practically minded person and he he saw it as a problem to be solved, not one that's just there. When I heard my diagnosis, my PA Rob said, who are we going to tell? And I said, let's tell everybody. So with that, um, with that sense of uh, wanting to tell people about this condition that he had and wanting to do something about it as well. He undertook his mission to fund research and to feed his own curiosity in the science. I think this is really remarkable that someone who uh, has this condition and becomes interested in brain science because he has the, the condition. At the beginning of this year, I pledged a million dollars to the Alzheimer's Research Trust. All right, I didn't really expect them to pull out a secret cure bubbling in a cauldron. But four months into this disease, it's time to go and see what they've been doing. If you're diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's, you feel as if you're standing on the beach and the tide has gone out and so has everybody else. And there's no one there. I just like the truth. Uh, at, at a time like this, you, uh, the truth is the only thing that matters. Professor Simon Lovestone oversees Alzheimer's research at King's College London. He's one of the people who decides who gets my money. And amazingly, he seems pretty confident that something approaching a cure is on the horizon. So, you know, when I sit back and think how things have changed in the last five years. It is phenomenal. It Work sounds in animal like you're models. nearly there. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> the first of those compounds, the results of the clinical trial, will be announced in a few months. We well, don't know whether it can will be I, successful. Can I volunteer to be in place of the hamster? The answer is yes. So this is the building where all the genetics happens. This is high technology stuff. Five years ago, we would have looked at one or two genes, mm. and now we can look at half a million variables simultaneously. If we know where to intervene, then it becomes a relatively straightforward task to find a drug to intervene. Now, relatively straightforward task is tens, perhaps hundreds of millions of pounds. That's the finishing point I'm yeah. looking for. Yeah. I may write fantasy fiction, but I am a man who likes to put his faith in cold, hard science. I feel very at home here. Uh, and at the same time, uh, Terry Pratchett became known as an advocate for assisted dying. Um, we heard uh, yesterday, we heard Rob Wilkins, his assistant, speaking very candidly about uh, the experience of uh, working with Terry Pratchett while he was going through this journey of um, 
uh, he filmed the, the documentary which I'm about to show you. Film. I'm going to show you a clip, but he. Um, uh, so they they filmed this whole documentary and then they went through this whole process of of rationalizing or working out what they would do and it wasn't just a hypothetical but it was actually um staring them in the face because um alzheimer's is is not a curable disease so this is not a clip from the documentary but it's it's one about him uh speaking about the issue but uh, the documentary is very well worth a watch uh, first yeah, well, when i first thought when i sat in there thinking about the Alzheimer's and I thought well what I'd like is you know let's hang out and do the best we can um, and then I'd very much like to have a lie down in the sunshine somewhere listening to Thomas Tallis on the iPod uh, after a nice brandy and and the nice friendly doctor will give me the little uh, the little jab which would just send me away and I had so much mail after that. Most of it, by far most of it, was from people who agreed and said, yes, that's exactly right. That's what we want. Why, if you're old and lame and you can't be cured and the disease is, is getting worse every day, are you expected to grin and bear it just because someone would like to care for you? It's not up to them. It's up to you. At the same time, he uh, became a champion for conservation, especially for his favourite animal, which is the orangutan. Since Darwin's day, it's thought we've managed to let over 200 species die out completely. Does the survival of the fittest mean that we are going to wipe out even more? I think you've got it wrong. You should have said the ascent of man. It wouldn't have been all that trouble otherwise. Before I shuffle off this mortal coil, I'd like to make some difference in the world. I want you to be able to stare into the eyes of an orangutan just as I did, so you care about them as much as I do. And uh, the key thing for us, uh, carrying on his legacy, is that when he was asked what he wanted to happen with respect to Alzheimer's disease, his answer was this. Give people more money to get this thing out of our hair. Research. Exactly. Has anybody been researching you? Not myself. It'd be fun. <laughs> and as it says here, that's just what we want to do. Um, uh, we're, we're constrained in the sense that uh, the kind of research that's involved is extremely expensive, as, as uh, he said actually in the previous um, clip. But we're, we're determined to try and make uh, whatever change we can, whatever impact we can from, from the research. And the Pratchett Project is not only about reading and appreciating new books or about uh, finding new ways to see the books, but it's also about trying to make a substantial difference to people's lives who live with this kind of uh, condition now. Uh, okay, so sorry to, to start off on a downer. It's a very serious, uh, it's a very serious topic and uh, it's not easy to speak about, especially after we've had such an amazing days of uh, positive stuff, but um, I'm really happy to take questions if you have any. Oh, I can already see. Uh, yeah, if you, if you have some questions, please do let me know.
I think that's something we should explain as well. If there are people who joined later, there's this panel. It looks like a little purple dot on the bottom right of your screen, which you can open, and then you can um, partake in that and pose some questions if you have them. Um, but James, there's just one that came in. What current research are you most excited about? Uh, well, actually, uh, what I'm most excited about just now is something that we're just lo launching um, probably next year, which is um, uh, a donor came forward and decided that he wanted to support Alzheimer's research. And uh, we said, well, we have this Pratchett project uh, going along and we would really, really like to build on the research that Pratchett actually funded himself. Uh, so uh, starting next year, we're going to have a researcher who's going to start at, uh, at Trinity College with us. who's going to be uh, specifically building on the findings that were created thanks to the mission that Pratchett actually made. So um, whoever that is, is going to be um, basically consolidating and then pushing this research forward. So I think that's a really exciting thing um, that we, we've seen. And it's, it's testament to the fact that people can donate something to a, a project like this and see some really good come out of it. Thank you, James. Um, and there's, there's a follow-up question there as well. And also, I recently heard something about using gamma frequency like and sound to treat Alzheimer's. And I wondered what you thought about that. The researcher is called Li Wei. Have you heard of her? And if so, what are your thoughts? Uh, so I know that I know that this has happened. And actually, Pratchett was using uh, a really weird head, um, headset, if you can call it that, uh, which kind of shot um, ultraviolet light or something like this into his skull and uh, he was one of the first people to actually be um, experimenting with this I think and I, I don't actually know what the outcome was as I say this is not really my field I'm just interested so I really comment on the science at all I'm afraid Oh, thank you very much. Something I'm also uh, personally wanting to know, James, where did you find all these videos that you could align so nice in the narrative? Oh, yeah. So um, these these videos have been uh, on various TV uh, channels over over the years. And now you can actually find all the ones on, uh, on YouTube. So the ones that I'd really recommend are uh, here, yeah, I will share my screen again and then you can see the titles. Uh, oops. Okay, so uh, yeah, <clears throat> Terry Pratchett, Living with Alzheimer's, episode one and two. They're each an hour long, but they're really, really worth watching. It's very moving, but it's an amazing insight into the journey that Terry Pratchett went through uh, in um in coping basically and, and living with this disease because it's not one of the forms of alzheimer's which um cripples you quickly it's something that's very slow and gradual and the the next one is terry pratchett choosing to die this is the one about assisted death and it's incredibly moving we heard from rob uh, rob wilkins about it yesterday it uh, he goes to dignitas and speaks to people who are planning to end their own lives, and they actually do. And uh, it's it's very moving and also very thought provoking because Rob doesn't hold the same views as Terry does. So it's there's an interesting discussion to be held there. Then the next one is uh, Terry so Terry on life and death, and that's the interview that you would have seen just there. I, I only showed you a little clip. If you if you uh, if you're in such a situation and you want to um, end your own life, then it's your decision, effectively. Then uh, the next one is Terry Pratchett facing extinction, and that's the one where he talks about uh, orangutans and he goes to Borneo, and it's a really beautiful um, uh, documentary. 
then um, the last one is the uh, is the final um, uh, interview which you saw there with with uh, John Snow, which was on Channel Four. They're all really really worth watching, and if you if you to um, YouTube, you can actually find all of those just now. Thank you, James. So, um, yeah, they're asking in the chat if we can get these links afterwards, but I guess yes. Yeah, sure, no problem. I'll post those as soon as I finish speaking. <laughs> I'm also wondering, it seemed as if um, there was a direct connection the way you presented it between, say, the preservation efforts for the orangutans and more about speaking out about assisted death, but is, is that directly related? Anyway, or is that just a coincidence? I don't think it's directly related. I may be wrong. Someone could probably correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think it was the fact that Terry Project was known as an author before this uh, brain health right. development came out, and then because he was so open uh, open about the condition, he um, uh, he became more than an author. He became a kind of celebrity, he was known, and he was starting to make documentaries. So I think it gave him the opportunity to speak about things other than his own condition. And he could make a link between his own condition and the condition of uh, an endangered species. OK, yes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, there's there's a, a difficult uh, question in the chat as well. Do you think that the UK will, will ever allow people the right to choose to die? End of life care and treatment is very emotive. I know there won't be an easy answer. I think it's tough. It's, it's tricky. And uh, I tend not to say, I mean, never say never. Who knows what might happen tomorrow? Uh, the events of the past, uh, how long is it? Four years in the UK um, in terms of politics have come to as a shock to many of us. So who knows what might happen in the next four years. Um, but the ethical concerns around assisted dying are many. And the more you start thinking about it, the more complicated it gets. Because it's not just a matter of someone deciding that they want a, a release and then being released, it, it's also, of course, involving their relations and their wishes, and then establishing that the person is actually making an informed decision. And uh, the, the process is is quite convoluted and and quite traumatic as well. More, I mean, not just the fact that someone's ending their life, but they have to keep being asked, "Are you sure this is what you want to do?" because they have to establish that they're not being coerced and that they're actually sound in mind. So um, I wouldn't like to say it's likely to happen soon, but never say never. It would be my answer. Yeah, that's a very thoughtful answer. Uh, thank you. There was also a comment much earlier in the chat about one of the videos uh, from, from Discord Monthly who said, we really don't like watching this video because so many people were in the room and for the first time they were confronted with uh, how Terry was becoming affected. Is that something you can comment on, like the moment of the decision of making it public and telling everyone like you said uh, the time just before? Uh you mean from my perspective or from Terry Pratchett's perspective? Well, probably from Terry Pratchett's as, as channeled by, by what you know about. I, I don't actually know because I wasn't, wasn't uh, uh, in the fortunate position of knowing him personally. But um, as far as I can see, he, he seems to have been an incredibly rational rational person who um, saw that there was an issue and saw that he might have the ability to do something about it. And so what he could do about it was to speak about it. And um, I, I think a large part of the fact that um, we don't speak about this kind of issue actually compounds the issue 
because uh, if you think about how much money is spent on uh, issues like cancer, for example, uh, of course, very traumatic, very not, uh, I'm not saying in any way that any less money should be spent on cancer, but issues like brain health and Alzheimer's affect many, many more people. And the amount of money that's spent on research for these conditions is far smaller. And I would be um, quite confident to say that a big part of why so much less uh, money is spent on this is because there's such a taboo about talking about these topics. And um, I think, as Terry probably felt, um, that taboo is not helpful. Uh, if we can talk about this kind of issue and then solve it somehow, then surely that's better than pretending it doesn't exist. Yes, thank you. Is there something else, James, you want to uh, share as an afterthought? Uh, only that uh, there will be a real expert who's going to speak about this later on. Um, I see Brian already is in, in, the, um, in the room, and so uh, I hope he's not uh, cringing too much at what I say. But he is actually a brain, uh, brain health scientist, and his presentation later will be giving us some hope in terms of what uh, what the research is just now and what it might mean for the future. So please do stick around for that. Oh, James, everything you said was spot on. <laughs> Thank you. OK. I think that's a, that's a great note to end on, um, that there is hope. So James, thank you very much for this very moving presentation. I think you've either introduced people to something they should be aware of, or either um, um, showed people things that were already close to their hearts. So thanks again, not only for presenting just now, but for putting all of this together, first the conference and now this Culture Night event. Um, so what we will probably do uh, is now take a short break of about 10 minutes. So you can all get something to drink or something to eat. And um, then we'll be back for our next speaker at the hour. Thank you very much also for engaging in the comment section.